Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Angelina Yi, the Director of the Leadership and Public Policy Program at the University of Science and Technology. Welcome to this um, wonderful public forum, um, which is going to be preceded by Professor Larry Diamond's talk, um, which is going to be Skyped to us. So, um, I would just like to say how honored we feel to have an illustrious panel uh, with us today and uh, to have all of you participate in this uh, discussion of a most important issue. The Leadership and Public Policy Program is an, a strategic initiative of the university that not only provides some mini courses for people who are interested in issues of public concern, but also um, provides and facilitates um, these forums for the public to participate in discussions of, is uh, of issues of critical importance to all of us. Um, so the proceedings today are going to be simple. We start with uh, Professor Diamond's um, relatively brief remarks, and then we will proceed directly to the panel discussion with the uh, panel panelists that I shall introduce uh, shortly. And um, the panelists will engage in the uh, discussion amongst themselves, and then we shall open the floor to the, uh, to the public. Um, we have some ground rules here uh, before I introduce everyone. Um, first of all, if you would like to ask questions, uh, and you're encouraged to do so, uh, please identify yourselves and also uh, limit your questions to one minute, please, or comments to one minute. And also, we shall call on people who have not spoken before. So if you've already asked a question, I shall probably give preference to someone who hasn't asked a question. All right, and I shall also give um, some preference to the younger members of our audience who may be our students or maybe uh, people from outside. Um, so, uh, let us get started. Uh, Professor Larry Diamond is well known to most of us. He is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Freeman Spockley Institute for International Studies, where he also directs the Center for Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. At Stanford, he is the Peter Haas Faculty Co-Director of the Haas Center for Public Service and Professor by Courtesy of political science and sociology. He has advised and lectured to the World Bank, the United Nations, the State Department, and other governmental and non-governmental agencies dealing with governments, governance, and development. Uh, I should not read out all of his publications. You probably can find it out, uh, find it in your handout. Uh, but proceed uh, to, uh, to let us welcome uh, Professor Larry Diamond, who is now uh, waiting to speak to all of us. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor E, and uh, it's a great honor to be able to participate in this meeting, and particularly with such a distinguished set of panelists uh, as you have here today. And I do apologize profusely that I am unable to be there uh, personally. I would very much like to uh, return to Hong Kong uh, before too long. So today uh, I want to do what I was asked to do and uh, ponder the question of really the future of democracy in Hong Kong, first from a conceptual standpoint in terms of how we can think about um, democracy, what uh, democracy means. Uh, and then in terms of Hong Kong's readiness for democracy. And finally, in terms of um, a couple of the elements of the current debate about uh, democracy in Hong Kong and how the particular challenge of structuring the next election for a chief executive of Hong Kong in 2017 might unfold. So we begin with the slide that's just been advanced here. What is electoral democracy? It's a means for a people of some political system or jurisdiction who have equal rights as citizens, and the equal part is 
very important, and I'm going to return to it, to choose their leaders and replace their leaders, if they want to replace their leaders, in elections that are regular, meaningful, free, and fair. That's really the key test of electoral democracy. This definitely requires universal suffrage with a secret ballot, and I would say emphasizing the theme of political equality, one person, one vote, that there's no kind of embedded systematic structural uh, advantage that weights some votes more than others, uh, and sufficient surrounding freedoms for elections to be meaningful, free, and fair. So that's the kind of minimum essential ingredients of electoral uh, democracy. Next slide. I can uh, unpack this fairly rapidly. Uh, we know what regular means, that it happens at constitutionally prescribed intervals if, as in Hong Kong, there's a direct election for the chief executive and a parliamentary system would have to happen you know, at no later than a certain interval. Next slide. Meaningful is a very important term. Okay, thank you. Meaningful means elections have to have consequences, that those who are elected really decide, you know, what policies will be, and um, important policies. They exercise what's called effective power in the political system, jurisdiction. It could be a country, it could be a part of a country, uh, like the HKSAR. This means uh, that there are no reserved domains of power. There's no hidden authority as there is in Iran where there's a, uh, <clears throat> a supreme leader uh, who is not elected and not democratically accountable who can veto anything that an elected government does. And it's the meaningful rule more than any other that disqualifies Morocco as a democracy. Because even if they have free and fair elections, which they more or less do in Morocco now, uh, if the king is the ultimate decider, then uh, the government that emerges <clears throat> out of competitive elections is not a democracy. Next slide. So when are elections free? <clears throat> well, I emphasize here, very relevant, I think, to Hong Kong and the debate uh, that Hong Kong is having now, uh, that free elections require relatively low barriers to entry into the political arena. And that means not that every single individual ought to be able, you know, however little support they have in society to appear on a ballot, um, but that there's no major political tendency, orientation that's structurally barred um, from contesting for power and from access to the ballot. Obviously, this means as well uh, the other conditions that I articulate that, you know, candidates campaign, parties can mobilize support, people can move about and speak in favor of their political choices without fear of retaliation. And here, a secret ballot is very important. And again, the surrounding climates of freedom that I've articulated. Next slide. Uh, there are a lot of elements of fair elections, and uh, I think uh, uh, Hong Kong more or less meets the test of uh, these for the most part. Uh, certainly a neutral and professional electoral administration, politically impartial police and courts, reasonably broad access of the different candidates and parties to the public media, uh, fair drawing and apportionment of electoral districts, um, incumbents not grossly abusing their office to advantage the ruling party. There's several more on the next slide independent monitoring of um, the vote and the vote counting, full universal adult suffrage, no overweighting of the votes of some citizens, I return to that point, uh, and the others that uh, you can see. Now, I do want to stress that um, 
you know, there are electoral democracies and even reasonably high quality ones that may disappoint in some respects. I can make the obvious point that gerrymandering happens uh, in a number of electoral democracies, including, I uh, very much regret to say, uh, my own in the United States. But, you know, the really, in judging whether a system is a democracy, we need to ask, you know, what's the overall distorting effect? And in particular, um, you know, is there reasonable political equality? Next slide. Now, I want to also very much stress in this next slide, which you now see, that electoral democracy, I think, is really not the goal that most people who are struggling for democracy seek. Uh, that is, people want something more than the merely electoral form of democracy. They want a higher quality democracy, liberal in the sense of being higher quality and affirming uh, the right uh, of uh, citizens to live in a free society uh, and to hold their leaders accountable and to have the protections of a rule of law and strong um, uh, instruments to control corruption and abuse of power. So liberal democracy in this sense is a fusion of three elements which may to some extent exist in a bit of tension with one another. One is the element of popular sovereignty or majority rule, the ability of citizens to exercise control over their government and to determine their government in uh, the process of political competition and to participate uh, extensively in that and, and demand over time accountability for policies. The second element is the element of liberal government, of freedom and protection for the rights of minorities and individual rights, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of the press, freedom of movement, uh, freedom of conscience, and so on and so forth. And at least some minimum floor of political equality so that, again, every citizen at least in a formal sense and as much as possible in some substantive respects, you know, has a structurally equal opportunity to uh, uh, influence the outcome of elections and at least have their votes counted equally. Uh, a civic culture implies support for democratic norms and tolerance uh, of opposing points of view. And finally, there's the element so important to Hong Kong of republican government, that is good government, with a strong rule of law, an independent judiciary, a variety of institutions such as an independent commission against corruption to control corruption and abuse of power, and a reasonably autonomous and effective state. So that's the architecture of liberal democracy. Next slide. I was asked to speak to this issue uh, on the next slide, why democracy? And I'll, I don't think actually I need to make these points in Hong Kong, but I'll briefly underscore why it's not just democracy, but liberal democracy that matters. I do think we have seen the global diffusion increasingly, I'll come back to this when I talk about political culture, of norms that value freedom, political and civic re freedom, the protection of human dignity, which, can, which requires, I'd say, a strong rule of law to protect individual rights and enable citizens to be free from subjugation and intimidation, which in turn requires the restraint of the abuse of, in particular, executive state power, including policing power, uh, a broader rule of law with an independent judiciary, the array of accountability institutions I've talked about. You just don't see these things uh, in the absence of uh, democracy. You can have illiberal democracies that do a poor job of protecting individual and minority rights outside of elections uh, and that may have high levels of corruption, 
but you virtually never, we could argue a bit about Singapore, but I would argue even in Singapore, you don't have a full rule of law because it would be hard for me to say this in Singapore, but the judiciary simply isn't fully independent uh, and uh, certainly at least anticipates what the regime wants uh, in political matters. So um, it is democracy that has the highest correlation with protection for human rights, control of corruption, accountability and transparency. Next slide. And as we see in the next slide, the world seems to have grasped this. Uh, people increasingly around the world seem to embrace this because democracy has during this 40-year period of the third wave of global democratization become the predominant form of government in the world. You can see that when the third wave began in 1974, only about 30 percent of the independent states in the world were electoral democracies. The red bar on top uh, or the line graph you see extending over is electoral democracy and then the blue line on the bottom is the somewhat smaller proportion of liberal democracies. And by the late 1990s, early 2000s, we'd reached a point where about three of every five states in the world were uh, electoral democracies, and about 45% of the states in the world were also liberal democracies. Next slide. And here we see the distribution within regions that uh, blue is democracy, red is the subset of democracy that is liberal democracy. And you can see that the states of the Western Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand are all liberal democracies. There's quite a substantial uh, presence of even liberal democracy, not to mention democracy, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, it's the predominant form of government. If you look at Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, that's the third set of bars over. The majority of post-communist states are democracies and about 40% of them, which means almost all of the uh, states of Central and Eastern Europe that used to be communist are now liberal democracies, Poland, Czechoslovakia. Uh, Slovenia and so on. Only about half the states in Asia are democracies. Only a few of those, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and Mongolia, uh, could be classified, I think, today as liberal democracies. And you see the rest of the distribution. Next slide. So now I'd like to come to, uh, I think, the real question uh, of the day or one of them, certainly, is Hong Kong ready for democracy? I, I, I see that many years after I saw this being debated in Hong Kong, it still seems to be uh, a matter of some debate. So let me try and mobilize some evidence updating what I've written before to speak to this question. Next slide. First of all, we know from the social science evidence on the relationship between economic development and democracy, that the level of economic development, and I would say more specifically the level of human development in terms of the spread of education, health, information, and so on, is very strongly correlated um, with the probability of a country being democracy, and I'll also say parenthetically the probability of it being a liberal democracy. So here we have the four levels of human development is identified by the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP. And you can see the countries with the lowest human development, only 28% of them are electoral democracies. By the way, that's not a trivial number percentage among poor countries. And then the percentage uh, rises to 45% among countries with medium human development, 70% with countries with high human development, and 89% with societies, and I would include now Hong Kong, that have, as I'll show you in a minute, very high human development. Next slide. In fact, uh, Hong Kong's level of human development is measured by the UNDP 
um, is one of the highest in the world. It's in the top 15 of all political jurisdictions in the world, 0 0.906. Uh, and of the top 15 jurisdictions, it's the only one that is not a democracy. Hong Kong ranks eighth in per capita income. It has, as everybody in the room I'm sure knows extraordinarily, high levels of health, education, access to information, and so on. I mean, by any reckoning, Hong Kong is one of the most modern countries in the world. Next slide. Some years ago, um, Samuel Huntington, in this next slide, specified a zone of transition uh, where we were likely to see, most likely to see transitions to democracy. And I've updated this zone, zone uh, from the dollars that he indicated when uh, he was writing 20 years ago to uh, 2013 uh, dollars uh, expressed in per capita gross national uh, income. So the zone is between $3,000 and $10,000. I mean, we're now at the point where uh, Malaysia has developed so rapidly that you can see in this top bar, it's almost moving out of this zone of transition. And China, which is the green line, uh, has, you know, has well entered it. In fact, entered it at about 2005 or six, and will um, be at a level of economic development, you know, kind of where Malaysia is today, probably in another six, eight, 10 years. Uh, Hong Kong is so far above this at over $30,000 per capita that you know, it isn't even meaningful to talk about Hong Kong being in a zone of transition in terms of the level of economic development is long since past it. Next slide. So let's talk next about political culture. Some people say, well, sure, Hong Kong is a very developed society in economic terms, in terms of some features of uh, development, but it's a Confucian society. People value traditions, they fear conflict, uh, they want to defer to leaders who exercise a strong hand. This is the Confucian way or the Asian political culture. So we actually have some data from the Asian barometer. I'm grateful to my colleagues in the Asian bar barometer for providing it that I think can shed light on this question. So now I'll go through some data from a public opinion survey that the Asian Barometer did in Hong Kong uh, about, uh, I think, a couple years ago. Next slide. Here we see um, three types of democratic values uh, that we have tested in East Asia, and I'm going to show you many more. And in each of these slides, this one and the ones to follow, uh, we see uh, six sets of bars. So the bar, and it's, I realize this might be a little bit difficult to see, but the bar in each cluster on the far left uh, in a slightly green form is China. The next bar over, uh, more of a tan color, is Hong Kong. The lighter colored yellow bar is Taiwan, and then in sequence Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam. What you'll see in these slides is the ratio of respondents who exercise a democratic sentiment to those who exercise uh, a more traditional or authoritarian uh, type of uh, sentiment in response to the question. So, for example, the first question, uh, we ask respondents, you know, which statement do you agree with more? Government is our employee the people should tell government what needs to be done. Or the government is like a parent. It should decide what's good for us. And here you see, again, the second bar, that in Hong Kong, uh, from the left, uh, in Hong Kong, two and a half times as many respondents choose the first democratic response as choose the second. When you ask which statement do you agree with, the media should be free, or the government should have a right to control the media. This is interestingly the response in Hong Kong that elicits the most uh, thunderously pro-democratic sentiment. Four and a half times as many people in Hong Kong favor media freedom as are willing to have the government control the media. 
And in most of the other uh, places we interviewed, it was at about parody. Government leaders are like the head of a family. We should all follow their decisions. The democratic response there is to disagree with that, and one and a half times as many Hong Kong residents disagree as agree. Uh, next slide. So uh, three more questions. The government should decide whether certain ideas should be allowed in our society. More people uh, disagree with this, that is give a democratic response, than agree. On the next slide, people worry about harmony of the community being disrupted if too many groups are allowed to organize. Uh, that's an unfavorable ratio, and it is even in Taiwan, by the way. And it's slightly favorable when people are asked, uh, sh should uh, judges dis defer to the executive in important cases? Next slide. If the government is constantly checked, it can't uh, accomplish great things. Again, this is kind of in most Asian countries and in Hong Kong's special administrative uh, uh, status, uh, the uh, response is uh, in the balance, uh, not so democratic. But in most of these others you can see, and the one on the right I'd particularly call to your attention, when the country is facing a difficult situation, or in Hong Kong it would have uh, been worded our system, uh, or the SAR, it's okay for the government to disregard the law in order to deal with the situation. And here you say uh, you see almost twice as many people in Hong Kong uh, disagree with that and demand a rule of law always uh, as agree. I might note parenthetically that the bar to the left is mainland China. And you can see on this item, mainland China and Hong Kong uh, have a similar view in terms of rejecting uh, government defection from the rule of law. Next slide. So here in the column under Hong Kong, you can see these uh, seven, I believe, uh, attitudinal items uh, and expressing the ratio of democratic to authoritarian values. And if you look in the Hong Kong column, you see, for example, um, in the bottom uh, row, in a difficult situation, it's okay for the government to disregard the law. 55% disagree with that, that is, have the democratic value, 30% the authoritarian value. Let me say, you know, no society has uh, perfectly and overwhelmingly uncomplicatedly democratic culture. But I look at this and other pieces of data we have, and uh, I have no doubt that Hong Kong's political culture is fully democratic enough to sustain not just democracy, uh, but liberal democracy, and in fact is more embracing of principles of liberal democracy than many countries that have been democratic for a long period of time. Uh, next slide shows these levels uh, with respect to mainland China, and I'll just note something uh, that people might want to ponder at a later date. Uh, if you look at these levels in China of the kind of democratic orientation uh, in mainland China on these items, they're relatively low, you know, except for one item you don't uh, really see it much over 40%. But the change between 2002 and 2011 has generally been in a direction of growing democratic values. I might say as well that this is particularly apparent among the younger generations in mainland China. It's just something people might want to keep in mind. Next slide, and now the final phase of my presentation. Uh, is Hong Kong ready for democracy? Well, we could look briefly at state capacity and find what you all already know. Next slide, that if you look at the dimensions of state quality or state capacity, as measured by um, uh, the World Bank uh, governance indicators, you see that you know Hong Kong has one of the most effective states uh, of any political jurisdiction in the world. 
Uh, these are percentile scores, so 100 is like the best in the world. And in regulatory quality, Hong Kong is at 99th percentile, control of corruption, 93rd percentile. Uh, and this has held up very well over a long period of time. It's only in voice and accountability that Hong Kong has improved somewhat over the last 10 years, but still lags behind much of the world. Next slide. So let me conclude uh, with a few slides that kind of present my summary uh, observations for your consideration. First of all, next slide. Uh, Hong Kong, it seems to me as a social scientist, is as ready for democracy as any political jurisdiction or society that has made a transition to democracy during the third wave or probably ever in society. It's economic development, it's class, class structure, it's political culture, it's state capacity. If you look at all of these, you know, it's a very favorable package for the stable and effective functioning, not just of democracy, but of a liberal democracy. In fact, this is one of the appealing features of Hong Kong's prospect for democratization is that unlike many countries that make a transition, for example, Indonesia uh, or, um, you know, many countries uh, elsewhere in Asia, uh, India is still struggling with a lot of illiberal aspects. Uh, Hong Kong, if it became a democracy, would kind of go straight to liberal democracy. Next slide. So it seems to me you, it's not, I think, plausible to argue that the obstacle to Hong Kong's realization of democracy has to do with its internal lack of readiness. There's nothing about the societal, economic, or state conditions uh, that makes it unready. It obviously has to do with some of the concerns and worries of the political authorities in Beijing. And I mean, many arguments could be advanced about what needs to happen, what is on balance right, or what is achievable. But I will just say as a social scientist, it is just not intellectually interesting, I think, or at all fruitful to debate whether Hong Kong is capable of sustaining a democratic system. Uh, of course it is. So then we come to the question of if Beijing has political concerns, how can these be addressed? This brings us to the question, of course, um, before Hong Kong society now, what methods um, of election of the chief executive of Hong Kong can be democratic? And I don't have the time here, it's probably not my place here to get into the details of how a uh, nomination method for chief executive candidates might be structured the next time around. I'll just say the obvious. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. And, you know, whatever method people propose, if they're going to claim it's a democratic method, they have to make a persuasive case that it can allow for the obvious principle, different political interests and orientations in Hong Kong to come to the surface and find a way to compete for public favor uh, in, a, in, a, in an election with universal franchise. In other words, if a nomination method limits the chief executive election only to candidates of one broad camp or perspective and denies a large political interest in society the right to contest, it seems to me there's no way you can say that's a democratic election. Next slide. Are there degrees of democracy or hybrid forms of democracy? Well, yes, there are. I was asked to speak briefly to this question. Um, and, you know, I don't have time to get into it. But I think often when people use the word hybrid, they think they can still attach the, you know, um, the adjoining noun democracy to it. And in fact, Hybrid systems are generally competitive authoritarian systems. If the field of political competition is narrowed arbitrarily to forbid a political tendency, a major one, to contest for government leadership, 
then we're talking about forms or degrees of authoritarianism, not democracy. Which is why I've said the uh, political authorities in Beijing clearly have the power to veto or impose a nomination method that's not democratic. But I don't think that if the method is not democratic, people should accept uh, an insistence uh, from those authorities that it be called democratic. Uh, I personally think, as a friend of Hong Kong, and I hope I can be considered a friend of China more generally, that political legitimacy and stability will increasingly suffer in Hong Kong, as will its international reputation, if the democratic aspirations of the Hong Kong people, which I think are very clearly there, and the implicit, implicit promise of the, of the basic law, are going to be perpetually postponed and frustrated. And I do think a lot of people in Hong Kong today are really wondering at this point, in part because of the data that I have presented here, which is, is I think, pretty obvious and widely known, if not in 2017, uh, when? So let me just conclude with this point. Um, I think Democrats in Hong Kong you know, need to put on their thinking cap need to engage uh, in dialogue with uh, authorities in Beijing and people in uh, Hong Kong who have a sincere kind of closeness uh, to those authorities in Beijing and you know, try and get to the bottom of, well, what's the concern? And uh, I can imagine uh, that a concern might be, well, you know, uh, democracy, unfettered election campaign, between opposing camps, this could descend into populism and uh, you know polarization and you know a kind of a more radical perspective on Hong Kong's autonomy versus a more sympathetic uh, alignment with China. And is this going to be healthy for Hong Kong's position within the People's Republic of China or for the society? And I just say. There are ways of avoiding this. The irony of this debate, in my opinion as a political scientist, is actually you'd be less likely to have a polarized election if you had more candidates representing different tendencies and if you use the method of ranked choice voting for the voters to choose between these different candidates. And that, of course, is also known as the instant runoff, where there's a list of a few candidates, and instead of first past the post, where people just vote for one and then it's plurality rule, whoever gets the most vote wins, you uh, enable people to rank their votes and the person with the lowest first place votes are, is eliminated and then the votes are redistributed until somebody emerges with a majority. The experience of this political system, certainly in the election of the Australian a lower house of parliament for many decades now, but also in a growing number of American cities uh, suggests that it's a very interesting and potentially powerful instrument for inducing moderation. Because if you trash the other side, then the other side voters are going to cast their second preference votes for somebody else. And often, you know, it's kind of the middle ground that emerges as the winner in this kind of contest. So, you know, this is something I think that may be worth considering. And in any case, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Diamond. Um, okay, thank we you. We know that you're speaking to us at um, 10.45 p.m., uh, on the East Coast, and we're very grateful that you're able to participate and to stimulate the discussions henceforth. Um, now may I invite our, our distinguished panelists to come up to the front. And I do ask the, the audience, I'm sure that you have many questions for Professor Diamond as well, but I do ask that you hold your questions until the end uh, when we have the um, open discussion session. Um, I think the panelists require no introduction. Uh, you all have the handouts. Um, the Honorable Mrs. Anson Chan, of course, is a familiar figure and a legendary uh, <laughs> leader in many arenas, and so uh, we welcome her. 
um, Mr. Zhao, Yong, Zhao Wing Hong is the Secretary General of the Federation of Students. He is a year three student at the University of Hong Kong. Um, <laughs> Professor Ming Singh is a faculty member in the Division of Social Science at the University of Science and Technology. <laughs> Mr. Zhang Yuk Singh is, of course, a familiar face, uh, the face of uh, wisdom and patience. Uh, <laughs> President of the Legislative Council. Uh, professor Wu Jiaming uh, is a <laughs> professor, a, a scholar of uh, Taiwan's dem democratization movements, and he is in um, the Academia Sinica in Taiwan. So without uh, further ado, as I mentioned, uh, the ground rule is that each of our panelists will have up to 10 minutes to express himself or herself uh, as to her and or his vision for Hong Kong and the path uh, of development from, uh, from now on, particularly in the political arena. Uh, so may I call on Mrs. Chan? Um, I don't think I will take her 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, the first thing I would say is, um, Professor Larry Diamond is preaching to the converted. In so far as I'm concerned, I can't really take issue with anything that he has said. So the question facing us in Hong Kong is not really whether Hong Kong is ready for democracy. Mm. We have been ready for democracy for a long, long time. Mm. The problem really revolves around what Professor Diamond describes as the insecurities within mainland China. But I would say it's not just the insecurities in mainland China, but it is also the insecurities in Hong Kong that is leading to the current impasse in so far as moving towards universal suffrage for election of the chief executive uh, in 2017. And also I might add, at the moment we don't seem to be paying any attention, but the 2016 elections of the Legislative Council members, particularly paving the way for 2020 when we're supposed to be able to elect all members of the legislature by universal suffrage is equally important. Um, do we see any light at the end of the tunnel? I have to say that given the recent rhetoric and the almost probably 30 different set of proposals that we currently see, ranging from one end of the spectrum, extremely liberal through civic nomination, to extremely conservative um, set of proposals recently put out by DAB and the uh, Federation of Trade Unions. I don't see at the moment that the road ahead to genuine universal suffrage is going to be very, very easy. Professor Diamond poses the question, how do we address the concerns raised by mainland China? The concern, very simply put, is China does not trust the people of Hong Kong to elect its own ruler. He also pointed out the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The question is, are we allowed mm, mm, to eat the pudding? Are we allowed at least to demonstrate that it is only by fair, equal election, one man, one vote, secret ballot, mm, that on the one hand, we can give legitimacy to our chief executive and in turn, enable this government to govern Hong Kong effectively. Because I think it is patently clear and easy for all to see that we cannot continue the way that we have been continuing in recent years. Because quite simply, this government is not governing effectively. You just look at the two years since Mr. C.Y. Leung has been in post. We're seeing an increasing erosion of one country, two systems. We're seeing challenges to the rule of law and certainly to the rights and freedoms that we all treasure, which hits at the very, very heart of whether we're able to maintain our lifestyle and our core values. These all have to do ultimately with whether the people of Hong Kong at long last is going to be trusted to elect our own leaders. We see this as a way forward in terms of not only securing good governance, but 
protecting our rights and freedoms. Because without rights and freedoms, although currently most people would say, well, the rule of law is still pretty healthy, pretty impact, intact, but how long is that going to continue if we're not able to elect our own chief executive, if we cannot hold this person accountable for his or her action or inaction, if we cannot reasonably ask our chief executive to help us defend one country, two systems, against the blatant interference from the liaison office in recent years. Now, we now currently have on the table, as I said, probably something like 30, if not more, proposals. Somehow, in the next few months, we have to try and narrow the gap between these proposals. But my group, Hong Kong 2020, is convinced of one thing, and that is that if you're going to meet the basic law definition and the internationally accepted definition of universal suffrage, then you have to meet three basic criteria. First, you have to give voters genuine choice. Second, you cannot set down unreasonable restrictions against people standing for nomination and for election. And third, you cannot rule out people with different political affiliations. My group, Hong Kong 2020, we've tried to broker a compromise, given that there are sharply divided opinions within the community. And I hope that in the months ahead, it would be possible for all parties to sit down and discuss these different proposals to see whether there are common points and whether indeed some of these proposals can be amalgamated. And finally, I want to point out that at the end of the day, it is not about claiming ownership for any one specific proposal on universal suffrage. It is trying to come up against the political reality facing us and arriving at a set of proposals that can credibly deliver genuine universal suffrage. This is what the people of Hong Kong want, and this is what we deserve. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Zhao, and we're going alphabetically. Um, when it comes to the topic of, uh, or the issue of democracy, I always wonder, what's the feeling of being one of the high, of, high authority member, like those uh, claimed by Professor Diamond, the one in election committee, or the nominating committee? I don't know if any of you have ever thought about that. Just let's imagine. I, I guess in the room there are 20, 100, 200 people, four or five house more. We are those members in those committee. And here we could select or nominate the candidates we want. But how about the people outside this house? Why they don't have the right to nominate? When democracy is about dialogue and equality, why we are not equal? Why the entitled right is deprived by the CCP, by the Beijing government? This is totally unacceptable. If we want a genuine democratic system, get it rooted in Hong Kong, we must have some action. Of course, we need dialogue. And that's why the Hong, the, the Hong Kong Federation of Students has proposed or advocate a two-track scheme. One is public nomination. We all have the right to nominate. Another one is party nomination. Only could this two system written in Hong Kong, we could really walk our path, seize our fate, Why party nomination is important is because we always criticize the chief executive. He has no party to back up. He always get backfire when he tries to propose any new policy or try to make any amendments. And this is to fix the broken system. But how we 
could really gain or make it, make these two systems established in Hong Kong, I guess there's no chance for dialogue because CCP has firmly stated their stance. We could not allow any parties or candidates that are opposing our stance as dictatorship. For 30 years, Hong Kong people have been striving for democracy for 30 years, and now we are still here, trapping in a, at the same point. 30 years ago, I was still not born. And now I'm already an adult, and I'm still striving for democracy. I guess everyone here would say it is ridiculous. In the following months, we'll try to voice out, try to make dialogue, like the deliberation day in uh, 6th of May, uh, the 2.22 vote, the referendum. But if after all this kind of action, this mild dialogue, and the CCP still does not accept the voice of Hong Kong people, I guess it's time for civil disobedience to come into stage. And I guess it is the only hope or only mean that we could change the government, that we could change the authority, that we could really regain our power. I remember when we first proposed this two idea, or, or other parties, they also advocate this kind of uh, nominating system. CTP or the officials from the government would come out, jump out and say, Oh, you are infringing basic law. We always say rule of law is important, but what does it mean by rule of law? Isn't it to protect our civil right? If the law is not protecting our right, shouldn't we stand up and change it? And I guess it's time for we all to speak up and stand up. And we students, or the Hong Kong Federation of Students, or Stolism, would not hesitate when CCP reject our proposal. Thank you very much. Professor <laughs> Sing Ming. First of all, uh, just like Anshin, I agree. I, I agree on most of the points raised by by Larry. Um, um, I would like to just share some uh, a few plain and cold facts. Now, in terms of the the level of press freedom, Hong Kong was given the highest ranking um, uh, in 2002 uh, in Asia. It was ranked uh, number 18th. And this year, it has dropped to 61, okay? far worse than many Asian counterparts. In terms of, uh, kind of, in terms of uh, the perceived level of corruption, if you look at Trans Transparency International, uh, the index has fallen in the last seven years uh, and probably will continue to fall. Okay? And then in terms of the, uh, the transparency, the level of transparency uh, by our government, again, many people, many critics point out that the government led by CY has been increasingly becoming uh, uh, in lack of transparency. One uh, noticeable recent example has been that, uh, has been that uh, the government has silently shifted the pesticides used on our vegetables. When it was pressed, it told the public that the pesticides, the change of the pesticides was in line with the international standard. But then when it was found out by the cable TV that actually it has adopted the standard used in mainland China, Okay, so the, the officials uh, did not deny any further. And then according to one associate professor of the CUHK, who uh, belonged to the uh, biochemistry department, who, who told me that he was one of the, f the only three members affiliated with a uh, professional organization uh, regarding the, uh, the toxic materials. 
he found that one of the three pesticides uh, is highly poisonous. Okay, and this issue hasn't raised the enough degree of attention. Uh, and then if we look at our current CD, the chief executive, he has got a long-term track record of being very much opposed to implementing full democracy, being very much uh, skeptical of uh, uh, even uh, uh, expanding some of our freedoms, including the freedom of, uh, 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 there's a kind of freedom relating to freedom of press that he has promised to, to launch after becoming a CD, and he still has not, uh, has not fulfilled his promise. Uh, and then on another front, in terms of Hong Kong-China integration, we have seen uh, ongoing tensions in the last few years. Okay? Uh, recently, one government principal officer said that uh, in the next 10 years, uh, uh, he would expect that uh, 100 million tourists will flood to Hong Kong within 12 months. This figure was alarm alarmingly high by any international benchmark. Okay? Uh, I just pretend, presented a speech at the National Taiwan University last week. Last year, no more than 3 million tourists uh, entered Taiwan from mainland China. What about Hong Kong? More than 40 million uh, in, in the same period. And the, the area of Taiwan is 32.5 times than that of Hong Kong. By any measurement, it was, it was simply uh, uh, outrageous, undermining the, the well-being of this so-called international city. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's increasingly giving the youngsters, the, the, including university students, the feeling that uh, Beijing is not trusting Hong Kong people, that Beijing tried to quote unquote colonize Hong Kong, okay? That Beijing, in the minds of many young people, as indicated in surveys after surveys conducted by Hong Kong Youth, CUHK, and, and Hong Kong Baptists, that uh, Beijing uh, simply tried to uh, uh, a world of democracy did not give us democracy and, and try to control Hong Kong politically, okay? And therefore, we have seen increasing proportion of uh, not only young people, but also educated people. They are becoming uh, very distrustful of Beijing, very distrustful of one country, two systems, uh, very worried about our uh, future prosperity and stability, so on and so forth. And, and, and some people also express their consideration of, of leaving this, this society, okay? Uh, and I think the, the, uh, the, the sharing just aired by my neighbor who comes from Hong Kong U, I think also vindicates those figures. Um, so in my research over Hong Kong politics in the last 30 years, I've never been so pessimistic about Hong Kong as now, okay? Uh, even, I, I think I'm even more pessimistic uh, about Hong Kong now than, even, than uh, 1989, okay? Given the recent uh, extremely, uh, uh, you know, tough stance, hard nose stance uh, demonstrated by Beijing against implementation of, of true democracy. It seems that uh, the pan-democrats, as well as the majority of the public, are now on a collision course with Beijing and this is not surprising for me if you look at the cross-national research, uh, which asked the question of what kind of regimes would most easily lead to political instability. If we classify the regimes into democracies, non-democracies, that is authoritarian regimes, and partial democracies, we find that partial democracies are most promising of yielding political instability uh, because of a number of reasons, uh, including you know, the, uh, what we call uh, selective appointment of the like-minded people by the government, uh, the polarization, and eventually which will lead to mass globalization for and against democratization. Increasingly, we have seen this happening in Hong Kong, okay, happening in Hong Kong. And, and therefore, I'm extremely worried, okay, that should Beijing continue to, uh, to reject uh, not only the, the more democratic platforms raised by scholarism or Hong Kong Federation students, if they continue to reject even the compromise models raised by, uh, like, uh, you know, 2020 uh, by ancient or other, uh, other group, I think the, uh, there's a higher probability 
of compelling Hong Kong people to engage in uh, non-violent resistance tactic, okay, uh, trying to seek for a, a real democracy. Uh, so it would, uh, so it, it would actually in a new era, okay, a new era of perhaps confrontation, suppression, and heightened mass mobilization, and perhaps more, more, more repression, and so on and so forth. That is, will Hong Kong go down on the path like what Taiwan has, has experienced in the last 50 years? I think, th I think this remains an op open question that needs to be answered by Beijing and Hong Kong people. This afternoon, um, I, I belong to a group of scholars who initiate a platform. Uh, basically, our platform uh, 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 more or less aligns with the one raised by the students, the scholarism and the Hong Kong Federation of students, okay? except one point. We agree on the platform asking for a genuine democracy. Within a week, we have got ab about 70 scholars support, okay? We simply outnumber the compromise model raised by 18 scholars in Hong Kong. I think, again, that shows the tip of the iceberg, that there's a, a very strong degree of support for genuine uh, democracy in Hong Kong, which Beijing can only ignore at its own risk. Thank you. Thank you. The Honourable Mr. Zhang Yuk Sing. Thank you. First of all, let me join uh, Anson and uh, Professor Sing Ming in saying that I agree largely with what uh, Professor Diamond said, especially uh, the pro propositions he put forward uh, at the conclusion of his speech. Uh, I'd just like to make a couple of comments. First, uh, yes, I believe Hong Kong is ready, ready for democracy. Uh, the question is, why democracy? Why does Hong Kong need democracy? Professor Diamond, in his speech, um, points out a number of advantages of a liberal democracy, uh, including, for example, the ability to protect uh, um, human rights, to pr protect freedom, to ensure uh, freedom of the press, rule of law, to uh, fight against uh, corruption. Well, these things we have already had in Hong Kong for a long time, without democracy, or at least without uh, electing our government by universal suffrage. Yes, sometimes we do slip a little bit in this international assessment, as Professor Sing Ming has pointed out. But I think it has also been pointed out that up to now, we cannot say for sure that there is a definite trend towards poorer transparency, more corruption, less press freedom. There is not a, a very clear trend yet. There, there have been fluctuations. We've gone through some ups and downs in the years past. Even if there is such a trend, even if we are doing not as well as in the past. Is it because we are less democratic today than in the past? It takes some very hard argument to convince people of that. So, and of course, towards the end of his uh, her speech, Professor Diamond mentions uh, some of the uh, um, the points put forward by skeptics, by people who believe that democracy will create problems for us. And Professor Diamond says, well, these problems can be, can be solved. There are things we can do to make it better. This is precisely what we have to consider. Because people who are now arguing against democracy in Hong Kong are saying that, look, um, all the good things of democracy we have already had, but 
some of the good things we have had, some of the advantages of, 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 of our existing system may go once we introduce democracy. Efficiency of the government's decision taking, for example. Democracy prevents serious mistakes made by the government, but democracy doesn't speed up the process of decision making. And already people are complaining that we are losing some of the, effic the efficiency uh, we used to have in the past, when we were less democratic, when the Legislative Council was not, was none of the seats in the Legislative Council were elected at all. So we have to address these problems. I'm, I'm sorry I missed uh, Professor Sing Ming's uh, uh, lecture earlier this morning. I think he tries to address the question whether democracy is the answer to the challenges to our governance, right? I don't know what the, the professor's answer is. Well, my belief is we cannot, we cannot uh, have any hope of improving our governance without moving towards democracy. However, simply by moving towards democracy, simply by electing the chief executive by universal suffrage and the whole let's go by universal suffrage will not solve all our problems in governance. There is a host of questions, a host of problems we have to address before we can assure ourselves that we will practice good democracy, that we will have good governance coming with democracy. So this is this is important. So this is, this is the first question. We have to ask, I, I, well, let, let me make this clear. I have said in public many times that I believe we don't, we don't have any choice at all. We must move towards this final goal of democracy as provided for in the basic law. And I believe that if we cannot elect our chief executive in 2017, Hong Kong would be in a very difficult situation. I've used the word ungovernable before, and I still believe that will be the problem we'll be faced with if we cannot succeed in you know, bringing in a democratic system of election for chief executive in 2017 and for the whole let's go in 2020. So we haven't got any choice. However, given that we must move towards full democracy. We have to look at the problems we have to address. We have to learn from the experience of other democracies, successful and not so successful, to make sure that we will, uh, uh, the, the democracy we, we are going to have will be successful. Now this is uh, my first uh, comment. Uh, second comment. the worries of the central government, the feeling of uh, insecurity of the central government. Now, it is, it is a reality. We have to accept that without the endorsement, the approval of the central government, we cannot put in place any uh, um, system of election, any method of election for the chief executive in 2017. We need we need the support, we need the agreement from Beijing. This is, this is the reality. So, yes, we have to consider how we can address the worries, the um, reservations, let's say, on the part of the central government about giving uh, Hong Kong people the freedom to choose the chief executive on our own. And, 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 uh, Again, Professor Diamond, when you defined um, meaningfulness, meaningfulness of, of, of elections, uh, I noticed one criterion you put forward is uh, there should not be any higher authority who can simply set aside uh, the result of elections they don't like, right? Now, does this include the power of the central government not to appoint someone elected in Hong Kong? 
to the post of chief executive because that 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 is in the basic law. Well, of course, our young friend may say, "Let us change the basic law." Well, try to do it, and we won't. We won't. We won't. I I I don't think we won't succeed in bringing in this new system of election um, in ten years, twenty years time. If you are looking for changing the basic law, right? So it is in the basic law that after being elected in Hong Kong, the chief executive has to be appointed by the central government. Now, if the central government refuses to, re to appoint someone elected in Hong Kong, I'm, I'm not saying that this is a likely event. I'm not saying this is likely to happen, but, but does it fall into uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the kind of situation uh, Professor Diamond says about a high authority setting aside uh, an election result they don't want. But this is, this is the kind of balance provided for in the basic law. This is one country, two systems. Right? When we talk of the sovereignty of the people, I don't think uh, in a situation like Hong Kong, because we are not a sovereign state, I don't think we can talk about the absolute sovereignty of the Hong Kong people. Even when Professor Diamond mentions the word uh, citizen, we have to be careful. What are citizens in Hong Kong? Right? In most other contexts, I believe that when we talk of citizens, we talk of nationals. You have to be the national, a national of a country in order to be a citizen, to enjoy citizens' rights. Well, in Hong Kong, you don't have to be a Chinese national to have voting rights. So it is rather specific meaning of citizens in Hong Kong. And to sort of provide a balance to that, there is this uh, power of appointment uh, by the central government. So Hong Kong people, including non-Chinese nationals, can have a right to vote. But after voting, it's for the central government to decide whether to appoint or not. Now, one reason which has been put forward for a sort of a, um, uh, having a more controlled process of uh, appointment is to avoid the kind of political crisis, constitutional crisis, when Hong Kong people elect someone which Beijing finds unacceptable. Now, we have to, to address this problem. Again, I believe that any election system for the chief executive must be seen by most Hong Kong people as genuinely democratic in order to work, even if, so by some miracle, the SAR government and the central government manages to get a you know, very tightly controlled system of nomination passed by two-thirds of LegCo and installed and put in place in 2017. Now, Hong Kong people would definitely revolt against that. And it will, it will, be, it will not be seen by anybody as a successful election in 2017. So anything that can improve our <coughs> governance by way of providing a democratically elected government, it must be seen by the general public and by the uh, international community, if I may say so, as genuine democracy. I don't think uh, uh, anyone can dispute that. So, but at the same time, we have to consider, we have to consider the worries of the central government. Uh, well, the, the worry is simply this. What if someone who is, who is, um, unfriendly or who is actually um, um, uh, confrontational, who adopts a confrontational attitude towards the central government, doesn't want to, come, uh, to cooperate with the central government, is elected in Hong Kong. How do we, um, how do we address that, that problem? We have to consider. And, and in uh, considering all the um, um, uh, proposals put forward, I think this is uh, one question we cannot avoid. 
Uh, but I, I, again, I agree with Anson that we need dialogue, we need uh, rational discussion, uh, pragmatic on a pragmatic basis. Let us work together and make it happen. 2017, the chief executive must be elected by universal suffrage, by a system supported by the majority of Hong Kong people. That is my uh, belief. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Wu, um, fresh from Taiwan. Okay, thank you. Uh, we couldn't agree uh, more on the fact that uh, Hong Kong is uh, already uh, ready for uh, democracy. And as uh, Professor Larry Diamond points out, uh, Hong Kong is not only ready for electoral democracy, but also for liberal democracy. Um, here, I have two questions to, uh, to ask and uh, discuss with Professor Diamond and also to engage the audience in this uh, convention room. Uh, the first one is theoretical, the second one is more practical oriented. Um, we know that um, in 1996, American political scientist Juan Lintz and Arthur Stephen published a very important book on the theory of dem democratic consolidation entitled The Problems of Democratic Transition and the Consolidation. In this book, they, uh, they cited partic particularly uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong with regard to the prospect of becoming a democratic system whether Taiwan and Hong Kong could be a uh, democracy and uh, uh, could be consolidated. Um, they use a concept of stateliness uh, being a condition for be becoming uh, a de democratic system. And they argue that uh, because Taiwan enjoys a de facto sovereignty, so the, the future is quite, would be uh, positive. Taiwan could become a stable democracy, but by contrast, because Hong Kong does not enjoy the sovereign status, has no the condition of stateliness, so their uh, prediction seems to be very gloomy and pessimistic uh, in that time. So almost 20 years passed, and now we see that uh, Hong Kong is really going into a critical point whether uh, this country, this city-state, would become democracy. Um, according to uh, Lin and Stephen, they argue that, they argue uh, a democratic subsystem in, is very hard to sustain within an authoritarian state, which means here in this context, which is China, of course. Why it's so? Because democratic legitimacy demands the application to all citizens under the state's territorial jurisdiction. So it is contradictory to grant political freedom to only a portion of the population and to deny it to the rest of the country. According to uh, Lin Sen Stephen, they, they say, quote, democracy requires statehood. Without a sovereign, a sovereign state, there can be no secure democracy, unquote. Therefore, uh, Lynch and the Stephen's argument predict a very, very pessimistic future for Hong Kong's democracy under the sovereign, sovereignty of PRC. And we know that Beijing guaranteed the one country, two systems formula to this ex-colony but from the moment it gained control of this place, uh, Beijing has been less than acquiescent with Hong Kong's internal political development. Because if Hong Kong 
becomes a democratic region, it would give the rest of the mainland China a kind of the so-called demonstration effect. And in addition, it would be very difficult to control this place if it's a democracy. OK, so this is my first question by quoting uh, Linz and Stephen. I want to discuss with uh, Professor uh, Diamond. That is, what will you estimate on this Linz Stephen conjecture? Do, do you think that this theory still applies to Hong Kong uh, in terms of current development, and especially the current uh, development of Beijing and, and and the, the condition we know that China has been under tremendous growth and uh, the phenom phenomenon of rise of China has been so salient over the last two decades. My second question is uh, about the mobilization. Uh, just as Professor Simin uh, talked in this morning, he argued that uh, the bottom-up bottom -up, uh, grassroots mobilization is positive to a negotiation between opposition and the ruling elites for a good outcome of democratic pact. Okay, if this uh, proposal can be uh, uh, taken as a precondition, I want to raise this question. We know that uh, the Occupy Central uh, action uh, has been proposed for almost a year, and we know that many people are really uh, very serious about this cause and uh, preparing for the mobilization of the, the, the people to fight for genuine universal suffrage and direct election. So uh, do, do you think, and does Professor uh, Larry think that this Occupy Central movement would help facilitate uh, for a meaningful uh, and productive negotiation with Beijing or not. So to so put, put it short, that it's, it's, it's Occupy Central is desirable or not in the current context. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's spend a few minutes um, exchanging views among panelists um, regarding the questions raised. And if I may summarize some of the more important questions because these have been recurring in all of your interventions. And that is um, the issue of, say, sovereignty, all right? Um, the, the, the very notion that um, Hong Kong may or should enjoy sovereignty, and that is essential to true democracy. All right, uh, can we talk a little bit about that? Because uh, we have uh, you know, this concept and the institutions that support one country, two systems. But I think it is also some, uh, a, a concept that is subject to interpretation and to um, elaboration. So, and the second question regard, uh, uh, has to do with, um, also related to the first, uh, besides one country, two systems, is the notion of Hong Kong citizenship, all right? Uh, what constitutes a Hong Kong identity versus Chinese identity? Um, how do we relate to the larger Chinese identity? Uh, and what, what causes this fissure between the Hong Kong citizen and the so-called mainland Chinese citizenship. Um, and then another question that has arisen is, well, I should also mention that you know, the word colonization has been used um, uh, to a certain alarming effect, all right? So you know, is Hong Kong being recolonized by mainland China? If you reject the notion that we are all one large nation, all right, we're part of that nation. Um, are we, uh, the insecurities of Beijing, is that a reality that we have to live with 
Or is there some way that we could somehow improve uh, communication? Is that something that can be assuaged by improved in communication, improved um, understanding, and mutual dialogue, and so on and so forth? Um, the f another question that has arisen so far uh, is really something that has been in, in the minds of many people. The various thresholds that we must cross before we can um, exercise uh, universal suffrage. And that is, first of all, the threshold, uh, the, the, the prerequisite for being a nominee for the chief executive uh, being a love Hong Kong, love China. All right, so who defines it, what defines it, and so on. All right, if we could also discuss that. Uh, the other thing is um, the nomination committee, the constitution of it, um, the various proposals that have come forward that have tried to expand it or somehow um, modify it. Uh, is that something that is also unrealistic or unpragmatic? And lastly, the veto power of uh, Beijing government. Uh, is that something that we can just simply wish away or is there something that we should do about it? All right, um, all of these questions, if you could um, you know, somehow you know, <laughs> work that into your argument. Um, whoever wishes to start first. Let me say a few words about this um, requirement uh, of being ngoi uh, kong ngoi kong. Right. Uh, to become a candidate. Um, Professor Yi says, uh, who is going to define that? Uh, what is the definition of this, of, of this label? Uh, a couple of quite authoritative uh, um, uh, people from Beijing have recently tried to uh, offer a definition. Um, Rao Guo Ping is one. I think he, um, in a, in, in, in a, at a forum earlier, I think a few, a few weeks uh, ago, uh, he said he would try to define this label, uh, love Hong Kong, love the country, <coughs> as pledging allegiance to um, the arrangement of Hong Kong's return to China, which is this one country, two systems. And also upholding the basic law and uh, abiding by the basic law. Right. Now, if that's the case, I don't think, I don't think anyone can dispute that. Right? To become the chief executive. Well, before we take office, as uh, members of the Legislative Council. We have to take an oath, and that is in our oath, to uphold the basic law, right? And, uh, and, uh, and abide by the basic law, and, and, and to pledge allegiance to um, the um, uh, Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China, right? So uh, we can't imagine someone who is against this against you know, Hong Kong's integration with China under this one country, two systems arrangement as defined in the basic law, or anyone who is against the basic law itself, to uh, be willing at all to take up the post of chief executive. So I mean, I, mean, I, I don't see any problem if, uh, if this criteria is defined this way. And moreover, Professor Diamond says, it cannot be a really a fair election if a you know candidacy is only limited to a, a broad camp, right? If one camp of people are excluded from the race altogether, well, again, at the recent meeting uh, in Shanghai between uh, uh, some of the Chinese officials and, and, and LegCo members, the head of the um, liaison office in Hong Kong said, we never, we have never claimed that anyone from the pan-democratic camp 
cannot meet this requirement of being ngoi kuang ngoi kuang. Right? So too often, this label has been interpreted as being um, um, used exclusively for people, for politicians belonging only to what we call Kin Jai Pai, the pro-government, pro-establishment, or pro-Beijing camp. So anyone outside that camp cannot be ngoi kuang ngoi kuang. However, the head of the liaison office himself Clarif clarify this point, right? This is not a label used exclusively for a certain cam in Hong Kong. And I think this is important. Uh, can I answer Jasper's uh, point? I think in, in a way he's answered it himself. There is no dispute, I think, amongst the general public as to what you mean by being a patriot. And I think all of us should be reminded of what Deng Xiaoping said. He defined it in these terms. You're not asked to embrace or love the Communist Party. You are asked to support the return of sovereignty of Hong Kong to China. You are asked to observe and uphold the basic law. And as Jesper points out, whether the CE, the chief executive, or members of the legislature actually have to take an oath to this effect. So why is so much you know, <laughs> heat being generated today by different definitions of what you mean by a patriot? I have no doubt that if you give Hong Kong people the right to exercise their vote in a fair transparent, equal manner. We will not elect a chief executive who cannot work with Beijing. Because the reality facing any chief executive, and mind you, you have to, <laughs> you have to differentiate between rhetoric uttered whilst you are in the process of standing for election and the realities facing you when you're actually in post. Everybody knows Someone who confronts Beijing at every turn is simply not going to be an effective chief executive. But I think the other consideration that is important in Hong Kong people's mind is, yes, we want a chief executive who can work with Beijing, but we also want a chief executive who will help us define, defend one country, two systems. A chief executive who share our core values who believe particularly in the maintenance of the rule of law and the protection of all our rights and freedoms, and who will help us defend one country, two systems. This is what the argument is all about. Yes. Uh, I think what worries Hong Kong people is that uh, to be patriotic, uh, to love Hong Kong and China is never mentioned in the basic law as a requirement for the future chief executive. And secondly, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, a senior uh, leader in China, Chiao Xiaoyang, uh, last year he, he cited two uh, uh, examples that uh, the leader of the Civic Party, Ao Yu, and the leader of, uh, former leader of the Democratic Party, Albert Ho, they were not regarded as patriotic under some pretests, some excuses, which raised uh, the eyebrow of many uh, attentive public in the town. Uh, so the danger of inserting this additional unnecessary item as a prerequisite for se selecting our future chief executive uh, is that uh, many people in Hong Kong think that uh, uh, Beijing would simply like to arbitrarily add an additional criterion in order to impose political control whenever it sees fit. So that's my point one. Point two, uh, 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 um, Mr. Zhang said that there's not been a trend established regarding the, uh, the decline in the governance of Hong Kong, okay, as far as that is concerned. Uh, it is something that, that I, would, I would politely diverge. Okay? If you look at the, the Press Freedom Index, okay, established both by the Freedom House and, and as well as the um, an international NGO, uh, Journalists Without Borders, the trend of the decline in press freedom has been uh, 
uh, indisputably, indisputably it's clear, okay, it's very clear, uh, downward in the last several years. As I said, down from 18 in 2002 to 61 in 2014, okay. Uh, it also raised the alarm so just uh, a few months ago when there was wide, wide, uh, a large report, a widely circulated report that uh, uh, HSBC, Standard Charter, and the Bank of East Asia, together with some uh, uh, Chinese banks in Hong Kong, they withdraw the advertis advertisement from a few newspapers who have been critics of the Hong Kong SL government and advocates for democracy. And, um, and well, that includes, of course, the Apple Daily. Apple Daily has been always ranked as the top one or top two newspaper in circulation. It doesn't make good sense at all for giant company like HSBC to suddenly withdraw its advertisement from Apple Daily. So there's only circumstantial evidence that uh, perhaps, okay, that many people would believe that perhaps some kind of blood pressure has been exerted uh, in conjunction with many other signs of decline in press freedom, okay. Uh, cases that I don't need to mention here. Uh, should that be true, uh, uh, it just raises a possibility that uh, uh, the risk, the political risk, the economic risk of doing business in Hong Kong has been elevated. The risk premium has been elevated, so much so that uh, it would discourage, if other things being equal, international investment in Hong Kong. So that is a very, very insight. sign. If you, look, if you thought about transparency, again, there are many such evidence. If we talk about the freedoms, okay, just a couple of years ago, the, the anti-national education movement uh, that was widely regarded as an attempt by Beijing to brainwash our next generation in order to control the freedom of thought. Okay, the freedom of thought. So um, I think the, my neighbor, the students from Hong Kong U, has indicated that uh, the younger generation and some middle class, uh, they, have become, they, have been, they have become extremely impatient. They find that Beijing simply uh, would like to indefinitely hold on to its uh, uh, control over Hong Kong without respecting the promises made uh, in the basic law and in, in the joint declaration. Just last month, Hong Kong used uh, in, the, in the panel, okay, formed by international experts uh, who are authorities on constitutional rights and so on and so forth. They unanimously agree, agreed that the ICCPR should be valid uh, for Hong Kong. It's part of the basic law. And the ICCPR make it very clear that, uh, that if we want, if, uh, if Beijing's promise of giving us genuine, uh, genuine suffrage is, up, is upheld, uh, the, the filtering, okay, the political filtering uh, mentioned by many uh, uh, Beijing authorities in the last 12 months, they are simply uh, obviously against the the, uh, the definition of genuine universal suffrage. Can I give a very quick response? My, my, my training in, in the university was in science and uh, mathematics. When we talk of a trend, you can't simply compare two points, sorry. Do not just compare 2002, 2003 with 2014. There have been years, if we look through all the record, our record, in the past 12, 13 years, there have been years when we did fall below, and then we re rebounded, we went up again, right? So much for trend. As for withdrawing of uh, advertisements from uh, a certain media, I'm afraid this is something that's going to happen even when we have attained full democracy. For the Press Freedom Index, I'm talking about comparing uh, year-by-year uh, year data, not from 2012, but starting from 2002 up to 2014. We are talking about 12 years. Right. I think they constitute... Year, when we fell down, when we actually fell below. Yeah, uh, the, the overall trend, uh, uh, I just showed to my class of students, the overall trend uh, exhibited by the, uh, uh, the NGO it was clearly a downward trend. Whether it's, it's moved like that, uh, I think we, I, we need to look at the original data, but the trend is very clear, okay? Down from 18 to 62, uh, 61, okay? That is very clear. We're talking about 12 years, not two years or three years. Sorry. Um, I, I'd like to just uh, express a, a layman's observation. 
why is it, if things are so going so well, why is it that uh, there seems to be this pervasive pessimism among Hong Kong uh, residents? Why is there so much worry and so much um, feeling that there is a degradation of uh, lifestyle, of um, individual freedoms and so on? Um, there, is, there is a sense of worry in the air, and of course this is totally unscientific and unmathematical. But um, there is a, a sense of worry both um, in Hong Kong and per perhaps in Beijing, uh, the authorities. So um, what, uh, is this simply um, mass psychology? Is it um, a myth that is being created and circulated and being refabricated? Or is there some basis? Now, I, I know that Professor Ming Sing has, um, has come up with some graphs uh, to, to illustrate his point. Uh, but then also Professor Diamond has some you know, more uplifting figures for Hong Kong. So uh, it, it's hard for us, um, without actually re researching all of this data, um, to tell which one is telling the true story. Um, I, I'm just trying to grapple with um, what to believe in and uh, also to help lift my own pessimism. <laughs> uh, do you have any, anything? <laughs> Uh, I, I think, yes, a very good question that you pose. Why is it that 17 years after the handover, today in Hong Kong, there's a general sense of unease, a general sense that we're allowing our core values to be chipped away, a general fear that the chief executive's main design seems to be to encourage so much economic integration and economic dependence that at the end of the day, when that has taken root, we have very little to say about maintaining our lifestyle and our core values and one country, two systems. I agree entirely with Professor Sing Ming. It's not just isolated incidents that Jasper seems to suggest. He says there's always been ups and downs. But in my entire 39 years of working with the Hong Kong government and another 12 to 13 years of being involved in political discussions, I have not seen mm, such deterioration in the quality of governance, in transparency, and even keeping corruption at bay. A very simple example, where is the transparency in the chief executive's sudden announcement reversing a publicly stated policy on setting no limits on free TV licenses, and then refusing to give explanations for his action and hiding behind the cloak of confidentiality on the part of EXCO members? That's just one example. Look at the recent allegations of misuse of public funds. This has arisen directly because the government increasingly has this policy of, a, of appointing people in our own camp to our main advisory boards and committees. Talk about the lack of transparency. Why is it that a district councillor who legitimately questions whether discussions which should be behind closed doors or open doors is suddenly physically removed from the police? All the evidence is there for us to see. The question is whether you want to see it. This is why there is such pessimism in the community at large. And if we do not address this, then I'm afraid you will have a serious risk of social instability. I think no one could deny that the fact that the the deteriorating situation happening in Hong Kong is under the rule of CCP. Mr. Dong, Mr. Donald Yan, CY, they are all nominated and selected by the nominating committee and the election committee existing now. Is that a fact? Think about Article 23. Think about the national education incident. Think about the Northwest New Territory Development, think about HKTV incident, think about what happened recently, editor-in-chief editor of Ming Bao. Is that simply fluctuating or deteriorating? I guess the fact is crystal clear. 
Democracy might not be the remedy for all incidents or all problems, but it is a necessary condition. It's the first step for us to fix Hong Kong. That's why I, I guess when Mr. Chan said democracy could not help us all, could not help in all occasions, I guess you have to also speak the later part. Without democracy, you could not do anything, just like what we live in Hong Kong, what we are facing. Uh, okay, uh, Pr Professor Wu, uh, if you would like to add a few words, or Professor Diamond, uh, and after which uh, we should flow, throw the floor open. Yes, Professor Diamond, do you want to respond okay. to some of the well, questions? Uh, thank you. So uh, I'm getting an echo here. Maybe you can uh, resolve it. But a few comments. Um, first, I think it's been, uh, frankly, a remarkable discussion uh, that's, that's just occurred, really a very significant and striking one. Um, second of all, I'll just say that, you know, friends of Hong Kong, uh, from outside share the concerns of people in Hong Kong uh, that something significant needs to be changing 17 years after the handover. Something significant seems to be changing. Uh, that maybe there's a threshold being crossed where the respect for freedoms, for autonomy, for good governance um, is really beginning to give way now. It's kind of a cumulative effect. I'll say it's not showing up in uh, the World Bank governance indicators, but those aren't the end and beginning of wisdom. And uh, I think what uh, Sing Ming uh, and some others have referred to uh, require careful attention. Uh, you know, I, I have to make a comment here that... Um, uh, I think maybe sometimes in discussions about Hong Kong, we're reluctant to make, but it's the obvious one. There's an elephant that lurks in the room whenever we discuss this issue, uh, and that is democracy in the rest of China. Uh, and, you know, I think it just needs to be laid on the table if you're trying to identify. Uh, what the anxieties of uh, the leadership uh, in Beijing are about all of this. Um, there's one that you're simply unable to address through persuasion, which is the possibility that in a China, mainland China, that's rapidly modernizing and experiencing a lot of challenges and stresses of its own, uh, the unfolding model of the completion or deepening uh, and realization of democracy in Hong Kong, uh, you know, uh, could, people could take note of this in the rest of China and um, it might begin to inspire uh, aspirations for, uh, you know, uh, some kind of more significant movement in the democratic direction in the rest of China. This presents a series of dilemmas uh, that I think run through this discussion. Uh, and here I'll just try and uh, briefly respond to Professor Wu. You know, frankly, there just aren't many instances, uh, certainly in recent history, really more generally, of a piece of a country becoming more or less clearly democratic and even liberally so when the rest of the country is, is not. But you do have an arrangement here. You have a contract. You have a bargain. It's one country, two systems. And uh, I think it's very important, uh, just politically it seems obvious, for um, Democrats in Hong Kong to repeatedly affirm an embrace uh, with a bit of affection even and sentimentality the one country aspect of this, that there's no doubt about this, there's no questioning of this. And I've tried to persuade, you know, many of my friends and colleagues uh, uh, in Taiwan, Democrats in Taiwan of this as well, they don't do themselves any good by pushing, uh, you know, independence rhetoric. 
Hong Kong is very different, of course, in this regard. But the other side of the coin needs to be pushed, that the bargain is one country, but in exchange, a recognition of two systems. That recognition just isn't unfolding now. And um, if it were, there's just, frankly, no good reason not to have a fully democratic election for the chief executive in 2017. And I absolutely, as a political scientist, completely agree uh, with what Anson Chan has said. I mean, let's have a little confidence in the sanity and rationality of the people of Hong Kong. You know, they're not crazy. They're not going to elect someone uh, implacably hostile to Beijing. It's one country. <laughs> You've got to get along with the authorities uh, in Beijing. So, you know, this then gets to the most painful issue for me uh, and the one uh, that I feel it is least appropriate for me to speak to directly uh, as an outsider. You know, well, if you're stuck, you've got a legitimate claim on political science grounds. You've got a le legitimate claim on normative grounds. You've got a legitimate claim on contractual uh, and in a way constitutional grounds uh, to, you know, finally get a, a, a genuinely democratic election for the chief executive in 2017. And, you know, the leadership in Beijing says, no, sorry, it's still not the right time. We need these protections and constraints and exit options for ourselves. Um, then what? And, you know, I can only say there are a lot of transitions in the world. I study democratic transitions where, you know, things get stuck. Uh, the authoritarian uh, power, uh, you know, kind of digs in its heels. Uh, and um, things only get unstuck, uh, frankly, with mass civil society mobilization. But that is a very risky strategy and, um, uh, you know, it could make things better and it could make things worse. So um, I, ha I think it's fairly obvious, um, you know, that there is a moral claim uh, and justification uh, for this kind of method. But, um, you know, the political analysis needs to be done in a um, very careful way. Uh, and... Uh, I think if people turn to methods of social protest, it will be more effective if they're protesting, uh, if they also continually manifest a sincere and very visible uh, commitment to the one country aspect of one country, two systems, and that can put them on a better standing for really making an impassioned and increasingly mobilized appeal uh, for uh, a timely recognition of the democratic uh, and implementation of the democratic process and democratic promise uh, of the basic law. This is a defining moment here, I think, because um, if, uh, uh, if a democratic election by you know, reasonably open and, and um, decent means is rejected in 2017, When's it going to come? You know, it could be rejected indefinitely. And uh, as Anson Chan noted, then there's the matter of 2016, even before 2017 uh, and 2020. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think the obvious answer at that point of when it's going to come is, well, it'll come when the rest of China democratizes. I happen to think that's going to be sooner than a lot of other people do, but None of us can know. Uh, and so I, I think that it's, um, I am impressed with how important this issue is, how fraught this issue is, uh, not so much with intellectual challenges and debates about readiness. I think we've agreed that, that those are pretty obviously resolved. But with rather serious existential and agonizing questions, about the relationship between uh, uh, the Hong Kong SAR and the rest of China and the central government authorities 
and about you know what methods the people of Hong Kong have left to press their claim if a reasonable set of um, appeals are pretty much uh, ignored and um, uh, and met with uh, resistance and indifference and um, I can only wish you you know um, uh, or extend my my sympathies and and best wishes because it's it's not a choice that outsiders can make for the people of Hong Kong. Thank you. I, I feel that uh, I really owe it to the audience to open up the floor to all of you who have been sitting here so quietly and respectfully. Um, so um, may I add, call on the audience first, and then maybe uh, if you can somehow. Uh, Professor Wu, you can uh, maybe help respond to some of the questions. All right, so anyone? Yes, please. Uh, again, um, your questioning uh, should be limited to one minute, and uh, please identify yourself. Uh, my, name. My, name. my name is Ed. I am in the hedge fund business. And uh, together with um, some of the people sitting here, we are from um, the finance community. Also, we support uh, the Occupy Central uh, movement. Now, just this past Wednesday, we placed an ad um, to, um, at uh, FT and also Apple Daily. And this coming Sunday uh, in the Catholic newspaper, uh, saying that, that we have 10 requests to the paramount leaders of China. Uh, we call it Gam Yong Yanpin because uh, just a small group of us, we think uh, we want to have fair play in Hong Kong and we want true democracy. Now, uh, I listened to all the uh, distinguished uh, guests here today and we have uh, Professor Sing Ming actually in my office uh, yesterday night. Uh, we have a, an Occupy Lan Kui Fong event that we, um, <laughs> not, not drinking beer, but um, we do it uh, since uh, Professor Benny Tai uh, had the initiative about uh, having a peaceful nonviolent movement uh, since uh, March of last year. Um, we want uh, Honorable uh, just to uh, sing, to speak uh, with uh, us, because um, you say don't use the word likely um, citizen, right? Use Hong Kong people. But uh, we are very confused about uh, your stance, honestly. Now, uh, we don't represent our firm. Uh, some of us are MD from investment banks, hedge fund traders, but um, we represent ourselves. We love Hong Kong and we all have kids uh, who are young kids and that uh, we don't see hope in the future. Um, you are a career politician, uh, Honorable uh, Jasper Zing, or Zhang, right? That you stung Zhang here. Uh, but um, having said that, uh, we want to say uh, thank you, uh, Anson, for traveling all the way uh, to uh, US and Canada for all the hard work and also thank uh, for uh, coming over here uh, just 48 hours, I know you'll be uh, going back to Taipei uh, soon. Now, um, yes, we will be setting question? up a booth actually um, near entertainment building sometime next week to talk about these 10 requests. Now, using our own time, not again representing our own firm, but as uh, Hong Kong people, you said don't use the word citizen, right? So just to uh, talk about uh, these 10 points, um, and then if um, any of you is uh, from the finance community or not, doesn't really matter, join the Occupy um, Central Movement the Deliberation Day. I think it's on May 6th on the Buddhist uh, Day. I think it's a very democratic way to express your view how Hong Kong should be run. I don't know the word uh, governable. Uh, Honorable saying you use it many times, but uh, sometimes using these buzzwords uh, doesn't, uh, you need more substance than just using the word non-governable. And, um, and also, uh, I think you are a more reasonable person, and then you represent what DAB, that's your uh, party, right? And we got really amazed how, uh, even myself as a hedge fund manager, how you can raise so much money like in, um, in one dinner. Um, I guess uh, my, um, <coughs> my colleagues uh, might have uh, some... Uh, questions like that as well, because uh, I used to raise one billion when I was with a bigger firm, but that's uh, with the largest um, hedge fund, and it's hard. But uh, if you talk about fair play, teach us, we want to learn from you. Um, 
I guess also uh, we have a Facebook. Now, again, you know, like uh, tomorrow, I, I'm not tied in with uh, Benny Tai or the three, um, you know, the, the three guys who speak for democracy and also for OC, but we could leave tomorrow. But uh, we speak from the heart that we think of Hong Kong right now is a, at a critical juncture. So even some of us here who would like to watch uh, the Bloomberg Terminal or CNBC, we still want to uh, speak up. Um, anything else uh, that I miss? M maybe just um, uh, stand up for those uh, who are volunteers in the OC um, finance group, just to stand up because we'll be setting up booths. Uh. Okay. Um, well, you've uh, actually exhausted your one minute. Uh, do okay. you want to? <laughs> do you want to ask a question or? No, I, I just uh, want to say thank you, uh, Jasper, and thank you, uh, Sing Ming, and also uh, Chen Tai. And uh, we want to invite them to our group to occupy Lan Kui Fang with love and peace. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have Thank a you. colleague, actually Trevor, um, mm -hmm. representing himself, not his uh, powerful firm, but uh, he has a question too. It's okay. Um, All right. So just before I ask, uh, uh, before I call in the second I think person. I think, I think I heard one question addressed okay. to me. Eh? Okay. Although I'm a bit confused with uh, your position. <laughs> the one question I heard very clearly is, how does my party manage to raise so much money? <laughs> the answer is simple. There is a four-character Chinese saying, That's our secret. Okay, uh, before I call on the next person, uh, I just want to emphasize that we, in all of our statements and questions, we, exp we show respect to all of our panelists and to each other, and also uh, we refrain, refrain from any kind of uh, personal attacks and so on. All right? Thank you. Um, okay, Mishana. Um, Professor Yi, I was wondering if I could weigh in on this question from um, an international relations and, and Middle East perspective, because I think we have a lot, um, a lot of lessons to glean from the Middle East experience, and you know, with the string of uh, uprisings in the, in the Middle East and North Africa since 2011. So um, I hope that this is helpful in some way. Um, you ask about you know how to redress pessimism. Um, I would say that pessimism, at least in the case of the people across the Middle East region, was the state just before optimism. And it was precisely that mass unease and mass disgruntlement that preceded mass mobilization. Um, and I've heard most of the panelists, Professor Diamond, it's very nice to see you, um, you highlight sort of the tension between Hong Kong and Beijing as the key impediment and the key obstacle to democratization. But I invite you to look at that as your greatest opportunity, your greatest sort of galvanizer, um, the thing to potentially push uh, the different forces, pro-democracy forces in Hong Kong to join together in, in a unified front um, and, and, and in many ways um, make the most of that resistance in coming together uh, so don't look at this pessimi pessimistic situation uh, as a problem, but as an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David? Yeah. Um, I'll just make a comment and, and then ask a question. Um, I, I agree very much with what was just said, because I think right now Hong Kong's got a perfect balance, which is, you know, in the mainland, if you want to get something done through legal channels, my, my friends used to tell me, Bishu, now! You must now, you must make trouble. Well, we've got the people who are willing to do it, right? Now, th the point is, we don't want them to do it, right? Jasper clearly doesn't want them to do it. I think the business community doesn't want them to do it. Hansen doesn't want them to do it. But that's the fear in Beijing now. To some question, you then get to the question of trust, right? Can Beijing trust? Can it trust the people of Hong Kong to elect? That's a really big question. Can it trust you guys to be civil? please do that, civil disobedience, right? Um, but then the question overall that wasn't raised today, which I thought um, uh, we haven't talked about, uh, is the question of external influence. And that becomes a question of trust again, right? Anson, are, you know, don't you work for the CIA? 
I mean, Beijing is convinced that you work for the CIA. You know, I mean, otherwise, why would you have gone to, Be to, to Washington and met with Joe Biden, right? And that gets very much to the question of trust because I'm constantly uh, challenged to, to explain, you know, what the British are doing here, what the Americans are doing here. I'm not even American, I'm Canadian. You know, and I know we're not doing much at all, but, but, but th there is part of the whole uh, process that's going on here, and part of the intensification, I think, as well, that people are seeing over the last year or two is that Beijing knows, if I can use a bad word, the shit's gonna hit the fan, right? It's seven, it's, it's too old, it's, we're moving to the time. Seven years ago, they promised universal suffrage, right? We're seven years since then. And, 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 and it's gonna happen. I mean, well, the, the decision has to be made. And as, as Larry said, they've gotta make a decision. Can they live with it? And, and so the, the time's really come. And so that's why I think in part we're seeing the intensification. We're seeing the, all the questions. I, I overused my time. Thank you. Um, yes, um, actually I wanted to rephrase that question. Um, shall we, sh should uh, Hong Kong's democratization be resolved uh, behind, you know, within the family? Or, you know, why should we make international appeals? No. Um, I think, first of all, you're absolutely right. The issue at stake is, all we are asking is for Beijing to deliver on its promise to the people of Hong Kong, which is that in 2017, we will have genuine one man, one vote. Mm. and the same for election of all members of the legislature in 2020. Mm. No more, no less. I think that whilst there is a sense of pessimism in the community as a whole, I hope you will also mm, read more positive, uh, uh, a more positive note into the action that various parties are taking. We're so certainly not uh, allowing pessimism mm, to defeat us. We're trying all in our own way to focus attention on the issues at stake, to try and fight for genuine universal suffrage and not a package of false universal suffrage proposals that will only set us back. And if we, as has been urged by some people, oh, we should pocket what little we have in the hope that we'll get more later down the road, do not believe that. Because if we accept this for 2017, then Lord knows when we will have an opportunity to reopen this issue. Finally, am I a CIA agent? <laughs> I think I'll leave it to the wisdom of the Hong Kong people to decide. Anybody who knows me knows that nobody can tell me to do what I don't want to do. And the reason why Martin and I decided to take this trip is we feel that we've tried every single method behind the scene diplomacy, mm, urging communication, urging dialogue, mm, urging the business sector to take a more sensible view and just depart a bit from their vested interests. And as Professor Diamond quite rightly suggests, when all else fails, there has to be mass mobilization and everybody mm, in his or her personal capacity should do what is necessary to focus attention on this issue. He is absolutely right. This is a crunch year for Hong Kong. Um, what we want is simply a humble request for three decades. And yeah, 30 years ago, you are still, you are still a handsome youngest. And now you are still mature and handsome. But does the situation change? No. And I think we have to distinguish now and, and civil disobedience, we should not mix them up. Now, if it is for private interest, maybe we can condemn them, or maybe it's a problem of the government or the system. And if they now for public interest, we should not mix the victim and the oppressor. Don't bring the victim, <laughs> yeah. And we should not discredit this struggle. Look at history. Progression could only, be, could only be made when people stand up and where they struggle. Speaking of, not working. Okay. Speaking of pessim uh, pessimism, I appreciate very much what uh, Michelle just said about the Arab Spring. Um, I have to make this statement first, like Larry did. 
I'm outsider, uh, but I'm a very special kind of outsider because I come from Taiwan, and we all know that Taiwan and Hong Kong are simultaneously under the cyclone of China influence or China factor. And I, I want to bring you to uh, something that just happened in Taiwan, which is a, a sunflower movement, Occupy movement in Taiwan, lasting for 24 days. And it's, it's been going peacefully, stably uh, for such a long duration. And so we should uh, respect and trust people, their common sense, uh, their capability to be rational and, uh, you know, um, uh, effective in demanding for political reform. And we know that before this Occupy uh, movement in Taiwan, uh, the political climate in Taiwan has been very pessimistic for almost six, seven, eight, ten years. Yeah, but all of a sudden, just because of this Occupy action, when 200 young people and students broke into the uh, legislative yuan, the parliament of Taiwan, then all of a sudden, uh, things changed. And nobody ever thought about this possibility. But once that happened, things could be changed. And so I think we should sometimes change our mindset. Because, you know, we are always uh, shackled by some prefixed uh, framework, say like uh, one, one country, two systems, okay? And even now, we are worried about the erosion of one country systems. Um, so I just want to say, uh, by quoting an uh, American political theorist, she said that if you think we are demanding the impossible, uh, if you think our demand is impossible, then we are demanding the impossible. Um, I, I feel that I we owe it to the audience to ask some more questions before we close. Um, any more questions? Yes, please. Um, it's very simple questions. I think, like Honorable Zhang has been the or is the former chairman of the um, DAB, and your party is the biggest party in Nashville. As we are going to the elections. For example, the one that we just mentioned in the in the um, in the chief executive ex uh, uh, election, given you have all the resources and the capability, why you or the the whole kind of like the Ginza Pai think that there will be possibility that you will be losing the election? I think the only question is because. Likely, and it's actually a question why you think there will be losing possibility the election. Why there's always the distrust that people won't elect the people pro the China. It shouldn't be because we believe that China is an important country. You're wrong. You're wrong. I never, I never fear that if I stand in the CE election, I will lose. <laughs> I'm never worried about that. Yes, you're right. The DAB is the biggest party in the LegCo because we hold the largest number of directly elected seats. That means you get the, we get the strongest support from the people. That is something I know for sure. So it is not, it is not because we are afraid that anyone from my party is going to lose in the election uh, that uh, we are doing whatever we are doing now. You are wrong. The DAB was formed in the first place to take part in democratic elections. We lost some and we won in others. And that has made what DAB is today. Other questions? Okay. 
thank you. I, 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 I think if I'm wrong, then why the election process that proposed by your party is so selective, is so limited, and not believe that we can have a more wide open selection process for such election? Again, your last comment is wrong. I do, not dis I do not agree with you, right? Well, it is a proposal, just like other proposals. Well, at, according to the current chairman of the DAB, it is a proposal which is entirely consistent basic law, which is uh, practical, practicable, and which has popular support. Uh, I was told, because I, 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 I'm, I'm not taking an awful lot of uh, 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 part in what the DAB is doing these days, but I was told by uh, members of the DAB that before releasing, before revealing that uh, proposal, they did several rounds of uh, public opinion survey, and the proposal got very good support, right? But still, it is, it is a proposal. There, it is laid down on the table for discussion for negotiations with other parties, with other uh, stakeholders, interested uh, quarters in our community. I think, I, think, I think that's what the DAB has been doing. Um, if there are no other questions, then I'll let, let David ask his last question. Given the context that you understand so well, and I apologize, you seem to be being treated as if you're the enemy today, um, and, and having spent time talking to you and as a political scientist knowing you, you are clearly not. And I want to make sure that the people who leave here don't know this, you know, don't think that way, that, that you know, you, you're, a fant you're an extremely I, rational I, I, voice. If I am treated as an enemy here, it means we have a biased audience. Correct. That's all. It's okay. That's okay. But, but, but then why would the DAB, and going back to that question, why would the DAB put forward such an, I mean, a, a policy that clearly is going to empower the young, young people, that's going to put tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people into the street? I mean, w w that shows really a, a kind of insensitivity to the nature of where things are now in terms of the political dialogue. That's what struck me by it, that it really seemed to be sending a message to Beijing saying, don't worry about the democratic aspirations of the people of Hong Kong, because the real democratic aspirations are probably a minimum 15 percent, 12 and a half to 15 percent threshold in the nomination committee, which nobody has said yet today. But sort of that sense, and that's sort of the basic line. That's the basic point. And your proposal is so far beyond that, that it sends a message to Beijing that, that they can get away with. 30%, 50%, and if they think that, and if they think that they're only gonna get 10,000 people in the streets, like 2003, they're completely wrong. And the real message is to be sending is minimum 12.5%, and if not, you're gonna get hundreds of thousands of people in the streets on July 1st. I mean, that's, the, that's where we are. And it just strikes me that from that point, I mean, the point to move is to move from there. So I, I was troubled by the DAB's point. Can I just comment on one point? Uh, I hope that uh, Jasper will be willing uh, for the DAB to share with us exactly who conducted the so-called opinion survey and where is the popular support? Of course, the DAB itself, of course. You know, uh, can, can we be transparent about this? Can we know how, what questions were posed and what was the result of the uh, polls? And the synchronization. Well, yes, I, I, can, I can, yeah, because as I said, I. I did not play, play, play any part in the, uh, in the survey and in the uh, 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 design of the proposal itself. But yes, I can, I can ask my uh, colleagues in the DAB. But, but that is, that, that's not the point. With due respect, uh, David, if the DAB, I guess, if the DAB puts forth a proposal very different from that we have seen, uh, they may make other people very angry. I don't mean people in Beijing. People who have been supporting the DAB. So I, I, I've gone through this myself in the past uh, 20 years. Right? The DAB has its very loyal supporters. 
and they have their expectations of the party. I believe that this proposal now put forth by the DAB is very much up to the expectation of its most loyal supporters. It may be a, perhaps a small percentage of the whole population. The DAB has to uh, reflect their opinion as well. Okay, I'm, um, I'm afraid we have to vacate the premises now, and uh, I really very much appreciate your participation, and would like to thank most sincerely our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Thank you.